Hello, I'm Bob the Booker and welcome back to my channel. Um, so again, we are in Booker season and there'll be a fair few more of these reviews, so apologies. Uh, but um, I've been working my way through the long list and I finally got to the book that I was really, really excited to check out. Um, partly because I just thought the story of this book sounded fascinating, but also because it is set around Cardiff, which is a city I used to live in and a city I absolutely adore. And that is, of course, The Fortune Men by Nadifa Muhammad. And this book is um, really, really exciting, I think. I think, I believe it's a debut, and it is all based on a, um, a true story, uh, based on a story of, of uh, that happened in Cardiff, um, which was around a group of um, Somali men, and particularly this one Somali man, who was falsely accused of having committed um, a murder. And this book sort of basically follows through that whole trial and that whole idea and really takes us through it and um, starting with uh, essentially building up this character um, and we get this really wonderful character um, sort of given to us right at the beginning uh, Mahmoud Matan and he is um, a young Somali man he um, has sort of had this relationship with um, a um, with a woman um, a, a, a sort of a Welsh woman and as a result, there's this kind of, you know, already set in, I think it's the 40s or the 50s. Um, there is already this kind of, yeah, 1952. There is already this idea that, you know, that's quite controversial for the time um, for, you know, a, um, a Somali man and a Welsh woman to be together. Um, and then particularly sort of as it all goes on, you know, we, we learn a lot more about the kind of how entrenched and how institutionalized some of that racism is for the characters. And so essentially early on we're introduced to a crime, um, the crime of, of this woman, uh, of, of a woman being murdered. And we're told sort of quite a few sort of details at the time about how she's, you know, she's had her throat slit and it's all quite violent and horrible. Um, and naturally people in the area, I say naturally not because it's the right thing, but because of the the racism that that was kind of that we're told about in the book naturally as, as a result of that some of the characters start pointing fingers at the um at various people of color particularly sort of some of the somali characters living in and around cardiff um, and it should sort of be said at this point that that you know they're in both bristol nearby and cardiff um there are sort of there's kind of a, a history of a kind of somali population um that kind of settled and worked there and, and because those are both sort of port towns um there was sort of naturally kind of a lot of port based kind of situations sort of led to kind of various migration patterns and so for example there were there is a sort of a larger sort of somali population in both cardiff and bristol and um those communities have had a really rich and interesting and varied history and um a, a, a large part of it came up uh, last year with the toppling of um, the statue in Bristol, um, the kind of Edward Carlson statue, um, and within that discussion there was a lot about how actually the Somali community in Bristol had been sort of overlooked and marginalised for a really long time. You know, this really um, active and thriving community had also just been sort of marginalised and pushed down by um, lack of support and, and, and sort of other, other things. So this book, you know, is very, very rooted in reality. This is not kind of, not only because the original story is real, but even if the, the, the trial at the heart of this book were fictionalized, the circumstances around this book are still very, very real. Um, and I think what's really interestingly done about this book is we really follow the inner thoughts of, of Mahmoud in this really interesting way we we learn a lot about him we really come to love him um for, even for his flaws we we sort of recognize him as a really likable interesting character and we learn quite quickly sort of just how this world operates um for people who look like him essentially people who are forced out in various ways um you know there are certain pubs or whatever that they go into um, and are sort of told to leave there are jobs that they apply for and are very quickly told that they're the wrong person or actually sorry we're no longer hiring today um all of those kinds of things that many communities uh, particularly immigrant communities um will sort of be you know familiar with you know thinking about also the the Windrush generation um in the 1960s in, in particularly in London 
Um, and so all of those uh, communities sort of, you know, had this incredibly tough time to kind of start anew and build this new life in a country that was often hostile to them. And so we follow Mahmoud throughout that and we, we learn a couple of things about him about that, that we then later come to see as being uh, the, uh, kind of almost these little clues dropped for things that are going to make his life a little bit harder later. So I am about to go into a couple of little spoilers. Um, they're not major ones but um, I will eventually go into a few more spoilers so if you want to have a chance to read the book uh, later um, please do go and check this come back to this video you know read the book first and then come back um, but and we'll go from there. So, some of the details we learn about um, for uh, Mahmoud, we learn early on that he starts carrying um, a knife or that he sometimes has something on him to protect himself um, because he starts realising just how violent things can get and how quickly things can get out of hand. And we learn how that then relates to the trial later. Um, the murder was committed with a razor blade. Um, he is found to have a razor blade on him um, soon after the crime but as he points out during the trial why isn't that one covered in blood if if that was the murder weapon this doesn't make any sense why would he carry two razor blades and just use one for a casual murder and then go about his business with another razor blade um, and there are lots of these sorts of facts and in the process we start seeing how Mahmoud loses all um, hope or most of his hope so he starts off thinking this is great, you know, I'm in a free and fair country, um, the trial starts, you know, the, the, the crime happens, the trial starts, he starts thinking, well, you know, I believe in the British people, they're going to make the right decision, um, it'll be fine, I've been told this is a democracy, and then increasingly he realises that there are bits of evidence that are being planted, or there are, there are bits of information that are conveniently being overlooked, or some of the witnesses seem a bit dodgy. And um, he himself obviously knows that he's not done it. And he also tries to articulate this in, you know, not speaking English fluently. You know, he's only sort of recently learned. And so he finds it difficult because there are some things that where he's just sort of blindly trusting people and is being let down and others where he's trying to express something, but it's not quite coming across. So he, for example, will try to explain how he can't possibly have done it because so much of the evidence relies on... Um, uh, one of the characters having seen him outside um, but actually he sort of argues sort of later only after the trial really well actually it's Wales in March in the evening it's going to be too cold and probably too wet to be standing outside um, for that long a time nobody does that nobody really would have been out on the street but this witness statement says that many people were out on the street and saw this um, and so we get all of these sort of conflicting bits and we, we watch as Muhammad um, as Mahmoud loses his um, his sort of sense of hope throughout and it's really quite heartbreaking to watch as he's sort of essentially ground down by the bureaucracy of the system um, the sort of the entrenched in institutional racism of a court system where um, na where people sort of distrust his um, his witness statement automatically he sort of see him as shifty where because he is speaking not in his in his mother tongue you know and he mentions a few times you know we learn that he speaks five languages and you know um and we get this sort of rich history of him and we know his character and we know that even for his flaws this is not something he could have done we don't believe that that's an option and the trial kind of rumbles on and we just sort of learn increasingly that we s sort of see it getting worse and worse in front of him and we just know it is not going to end up well for, for our for our beloved Mahmoud and it, it's difficult because we we love him and we kind of really come to to like him throughout the story and it's just so difficult to sort of see how he kind of loses that and we get this kind of passage sort of later in the book um, trying to carve out his solitude in that crowded room. So this is when he's in um, a prison, um, sort of awaiting trial. He won't turn in the bed unless he is hidden under the blanket. He never looks at the warders or talks to them. It's bad enough that he has to overhear their dumb chatter. English is like barbed wire to him now, a lethal language that he needs to keep out of his mouth. The trial is still ongoing in his dreams and waking thoughts. 
He plays judge, prosecution, defence all at once, ripping himself to shreds, then calling order before arguing his innocence again and again and again. In court, he had been copying his barrister's words. There, it may be, I know not, and it is not for me to explain. When he had kept saying, um, I am not going to imagine, the truth of the statements against him, but from his own mouth it sounded so different. He should have wept, cried, pleaded, shredded his clothes, told them he was only a savage who had been outwitted by clever Welsh policemen, a sad savage with smiling eyes, a smiling savage with sad eyes. And I thought this passage was really, really um, heartbreaking because we see that Mahmoud has gone from this sort of very effervescent, loving character to someone who basically realises how badly the, the deck is stacked against him. And actually, if he had played the part um, and basically thrown himself to the ground and said, oh, you know, I'm a, what was it, how does he say, I'm a, you know, a stupid savage. Um, I'm, yeah, only a savage who had been outwitted by clever p Welsh policemen. If he had basically got down on his hands and knees and said, oh, look, you know, the inconsistencies in my statements, it's just because I'm really stupid, you're also clever, blah, 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 he may have been saved. And I think this makes a really clever but subtle point here about how often marginalised people, particularly, I think, people of colour, are sort of forced to assume certain roles in order to be um, given a free pass by the sort of, uh, by people, in, by the, the kind of powerful in society, right? So as soon as he doesn't play that role, as soon as he stands up for himself to some degree and says, actually, I don't know um, why that happened, or of course, this is what I was doing. I was doing this thing. Why don't you believe me? He isn't playing the role that people are expecting of him, which is to basically submit and be weak and as soon as he doesn't do that he becomes shifty in the eyes of um of the prosecution of the jury and that really harms his case and i think it's such a cleverly done point um that nadifa muhammad captures here of the the hoops that he goes through to prove his innocence when so many people around him know that he's not. And we also get these little references to the rest of the Somali community around him who also don't say anything, even though they must know that it wasn't him, because they know that they potentially face recriminations as well if they speak out. Either, you know, somebody who's trying to hide something might come for them, or they may be seen as, seen as colluding and they may have the finger pointed at them instead. And so we get this really strong sense that he is trapped and it is not a position that he can really ever get out of apart from absolutely submitting and, and, and making himself the lowest of the low just to be somewhat passable in people's eyes, which is, is heartbreaking, but I think really well handled in this book. And we get this sense of submission um, in the book in another place as well. Um, he says, um, he had tried to hold it together, took deep breaths, paced the cell, picked up the Quran, squeezed his head between his hands, but it was too much. These men had taken too much from him, his freedom, his dignity, his innocence, and now his name was finished too. Said in the same breath as someone like Archie, the lowest of the low. He had been too meek and they'd mistaken him for the kind of man they could do this to. If there was any shred of manhood left in him, he would tear this door down, take this cell apart brick by brick raw and thrash. And so we get this really interesting sort of parallel where sometimes he feels like he needs to be stronger and stronger and destroy things, but he realises that he doesn't hold the power there. Then he realises that he could submit, but that feels even more harmful to him in his psyche and also doesn't really get him anywhere. And so he's trapped. We know that essentially this, this court case is a foregone conclusion. And yet all we can do is watch. And it's kind of an interesting perspective watching this as a, as a reader because we, we are essentially obviously powerless to do anything. And we watch and can only wait to see what happens to him um, as it rumbles on. Um, meanwhile, knowing that somebody else in the book has, done, has committed the crime. Um, and there is a really beautiful moment uh, in the epilogue of this book where it talks about next steps and it basically says you know that the family years later try to argue for um his sentence to be lifted um this is you know sort of 30 years after the case because new evidence appears to appear um appears to appear appears to kind of come up and um it's sort of then kind of a thing of this idea of justice that even if it doesn't change the outcome even though by this point 
you know, um, Mahmoud is dead, justice is still important for them, for him, for his community and for, for his family to know that he wasn't a criminal and to have that kind of expunged from his record, which I just think is so interestingly handled. Um, so I thought, I thought this book, as again, you probably can tell, I thought this book did so many things really interestingly. Um, I really liked it. I think it is a strong one, particularly for a debut. I think, you know, um, it's great to see a brand new voice coming with a, a community who we don't often hear about in um, in UK literature. We don't often hear as much about the Somali population in the UK. Um, we especially don't hear about it um, outside of, you know, cities like London. We, we almost always get it from that perspective. So to get a book based in Cardiff, focusing on a Somali population, focusing on this trial, looking at justice and injustice, um, is so interesting and I'm really excited that the Book of Judges picked up on this book and uh, gave it the kind of boost that I think it deserves. Um, it's one that I would quite like to see on the shortlist actually. I really want to see this book get into more people's hands um, because I think it's doing some really interesting things here and um, yeah, I, I really enjoyed it. So I'd love to hear your thoughts if you've had a chance to, to read the book. Um, if you haven't, um, uh, I hope I haven't spoiled too much, uh, but um, please, yeah, do let me know your thoughts below. And especially if you know of any other books that deal with similar um, topics, I'd really love to know about that as well. So thank you all so, so much. Take care and enjoy the book of season. Bye bye.